Can you guys hear me? Or do I need to raise this microphone up? Let's see. There we go. Well, it's my pleasure to be here. I really don't get all that many opportunities to preach, and so I, I, I jump at the chances when I do. Um, so in order to start, I saw my friend come in. Garrett, would you stand up? Everybody say hi to Garrett. Uh, you probably all know him. Okay, thank you, Garrett. <laughs> you can sit down. So, um, so I've been able to get to know Garrett over the past year and a half or so. And um, I have to tell you, that I think Garrett is one of the weirdest people that I know, okay? <laughs> that's, that's, yeah. Okay, now hear me out. So Garrett will put his shoes on, he'll, he'll stand up, walk outside the door, and then he goes all Forrest Gump and just starts running, and runs, and runs, and runs, and runs, and um, I can't hardly run 100 yards straight unless you put a ball in front of me and so it can distract me, but... Um, so he keeps on running, and then he hears that his, he was telling me on, Thursday, on Tuesday, that he heard that some of his friends or his teammates had run farther than he did, so he just decided to add on a couple of four or five more miles or whatever. I just, uh, is that not weird? I mean, am I the only one that, anyway. So in, in all reality, I, I want to say that I really do appreciate Garrett. I have a ton of respect for him. I really appreciate his love for people and his, the way he wants to reach out, to, especially to the international students. That's how I've been able to get to know him um, and how he is willing just to do about anything for people. Even his running, I admire. Uh, growing up, and I did a lot of different things, uh, music and sports and Bible, math competitions, Bible co knowledge competitions. Um, I was okay at a good number of things, but now as I have gotten older, I wish I would have chosen one thing and gotten really good at it. And that's what I see in Garrett with his running, how he runs every single day and he pushes his body to the limits. And we just, I don't know how many of you had time because you were in school, but I watched way too much of the Olympics uh, these last few weeks. And talk about people who want to master something. I mean, they have taken decades, or some of the, uh, some of the curling guys, 30 years of every single day, and not that it's real demanding or anything like that, but, it, but still, to take the mastery and to figure out the strategy, they had to, they had to concentrate and become a master of that. Um, but, and when it comes down to it, and you can hold that gold medal, and you can say you are the best at something, that would, just, that would be really cool. And so tonight, the passage that I was given is 1 Corinthians 13. This is a difficult passage for uh, multiple reasons. The number one is, you have all heard it so much. It's, it's not something that's new to you. You've heard it at engagement parties, at anniversary parties, at wedding parties, you've heard, and, and other places. You've heard umpteen sermons on it. And so no matter how I spin this, you've probably already heard that facet of this passage. Uh, and the second reason why I find this passage so difficult is that in my mind, I'm not sure I've ever really heard a person preach on this uh, chapter and really got to the actual topic that they are talking about. And you all know what that topic is because you heard Shandy, well, if you heard Shandy preach last week, you know what it is, and it has to do with spiritual gifts. So as Americans, we, um, I, we don't know what to do with spiritual gifts. So we either ignore them and act like they don't exist, or we emphasize them to a harmful degree. We as Americans do everything to the extremes, and that's what I do as a person as well. Um, and with spiritual gifts, the, and, the, and this topic, we, there's no exception. We, like I said, we either say they don't happen anymore, or our total spiritual lives are only pointed at making them happen in, in our lives. Neither attitude is healthy. Neither attitude is biblical. But that is who we as are, Americans are. We're ex extremists. So talking about love, I, uh, when I was doing my research, I saw a Peanuts cartoon uh, sh that shows Lucy standing there with her arms folded and a very stern look on her face. Charlie Brown pleads with, Lu pleads with her, Lucy, you must be more loving. This world really needs more love. You have to let yourself love to make this world a better place. And so what does Lucy do? Lucy angrily whirls around, knocks Charlie Brown to the ground, and she screams at him, look, I love the world, it's people I don't like. 
And so love is a great thing. Sometimes people make it a little more difficult. Love is awesome. We search for it. We long for it. We sing about it. We write about it. We daydream about it. Hopefully none of you are daydreaming right now. Um, But in fact, if we don't get it, we die. Um, my, my father-in-law and my sister-in-law took a missionary trip, a missions trip to uh, Russia, and they went to over and worked in an orphanage. And they, they had a really good trip for over a week, and they really enjoyed the orphanage. But they said the one eerie time was when they walked into the nursery, the zero to two, zero to three-year-old uh, room. There were about 80 to 100 kids in that room, and it was like that. It was deathly silent. How can you go into a nursery with two kids in any church during a, during a service and have it be that quiet? And they, and they, they saw a couple of, of, of the workers sitting there. They were feeding two babies at a time. And, and after a little bit of asking, they found out that for the most part, the babies got touched once a day when the, for about 30 seconds as they were changing their diapers. Most of the kids never even left that nursery because without that touch, without that love, without that comfort and cuddling, they would die. And some of the kids that did, in fact, make it, some of the kids that they met were seven, eight, nine, ten years old, but they looked like two- and three-year-olds because the stuntedness of their lives, their bodies would not actually work correctly without that physical touch, without that love. We, as humans, need love to the degree that it is life-giving. The Bible has four words for love. The first one is eros, or erotic love, a love that you are all probably feeling fairly strongly right now with the hormones going through your bodies and stuff. And so I don't really need to explain that one any farther. If not, you can go talk to your parents or Nathaniel or something like that. (laughs) Yeah. So, okay, so the second one is phileo love. That's the brotherly love, Philadelphia, the, the city of brotherly love. Then there is storge, uh, or love for your family, for your kids, for your community. This is even a love that's used to describe your feeling for dogs and cats. Um, and so it's that kind of just uh, a love that is very strong, but not the emotional type. And then the last one is agape love, or that overarching uh, total love. You all probably had at least heard a part of that. And love is necessary in life. And it is very, very true for the church. In this passage, agape is the only word used for love. A little bit, I want to give you a little bit more about the history of agape. At the time of Christ, agape was a very new word. There is no record of this word being used as a verb before the New Testament. Agape, in some ways, was the new word that was the Greek equivalent to the Hebrew word hesed, which was in the Old Testament. Um, Hesed is translated loving kindness, unfailing love, or mercy. It was the word used to describe God's covenant loyalty with with his people. So this word was very powerful to the Israelites, and they would have recognized that Paul was using this word immediately. It's the extreme example of love that they had. It was so strong that it was, in fact, unattainable. But that's why they used it, because it was so strong. I took the time to explain all of that to you, since we are looking at what most people would call the love chapter in the Bible. And that is true in the sense that it is the longest and probably most complete explanation of what love is. But what most people do not get right is that this is in the context of chapters 12 and chapters 14. It is supposed to be one unit read together, not just a digression into another topic in between two chapters that are talking about spiritual gifts. This chapter, even though it is describing love, is really talking about the witness of the church and how spiritual gifts come into play to build each other up to be complete. Just like Shandy talked about last week, being different parts of the body. They all have different gifts, but they all form to make one. All in all, this chapter is a rebuke to a dysfunctional Corinthian church and how they were abusing the spiritual gifts. There are three obvious sections in this chapter, which makes it really easy for me to divide the sermon into three sections. And we all know that any good sermon is always divided into three sections. So, in these 13 verses, Paul gives us three distinct and specific examples of what love is and what love is not. 
So let's go ahead and read that first section, and they were very kind enough to uh, get these so you could read them on the section or your devices or whatever, the screen. 1 Corinthians, we're going to start with 1231b and, th and through 13.3. But now let me show you a new a way of life that is the best of all. If I could speak all the languages of earth and of angels, but didn't have love, I would only be a noisy gong or a clanging cymbal. If I had the gift of prophecy, and if I understood all of God's secret plans and possessed all knowledge, if I had such faith that I could move mountains, but didn't love others, I would be nothing." If I gave everything I have to the poor and even sacrificed my body, I could boast about it, but if I didn't love others, I wouldn't have gained anything. So the first point that Paul is trying to make is that love is so much greater than any spiritual gift. In these verses, there are five different gifts mentioned and one gift kind of explained to the extreme. Tongues, prophecy, knowledge, faith, and giving and then giving going to the extreme of martyrdom. All of these gifts are great and are necessary for the building up of the church. I'm not really going to go into each one of these uh, very deep, but I will give a quick definition of each one so we can all be on the same page. Um, that's the deep part is last week and the next couple of weeks, uh, they, they get all the fun. So, uh, not to take anything away from next week's speaker, but 14.2 gives us a fairly good definition of what tongues is. For if you have the ability to speak in tongues, you will be talking only to God, since people won't be able to understand you. You will be speaking by the power of the Spirit, but it will all be mysterious. So, according to Paul, tongues is a private prayer language. Before we go any farther... Let me tell you a little bit about myself. Yeah, as, as Nathaniel said, I was a missionary in Papua New Guinea for five years, and I've traveled to a significant number of, min, of countries after that, as well as, as being a missions minister. And so I have been able to see a few things on those journeys. Uh, while we were missionaries, uh, there was an eight- or nine-year-old girl who was carried to us, and they asked us to pray for her. She was as stiff as a board and quiet at first. Her eyes had rolled back into her head, and then we started praying for her. And then she made some noises and some sounds and moved a very little bit. But they were not sounds that any eight- or nine-year-old girl would ever make. We originally thought that she was sick and had cerebral malaria or something. But after praying over her and anointing her with oil, we all knew she was demon-possessed. So if you think that I am, because of my definition of, of tongues, if, if you think that I am ignoring the spiritual realm, I beg you to reconsider. I believe we interact with the spiritual realm constantly, and we truly are, as Ephesians, Ephesians 6.12 says, for we are not fighting against flesh and blood enemies, but against evil rulers and authorities of the unseen world, against mighty powers of this dark world, and against evil spirits in the heavenly places. And also, later in 14, uh, Paul states that he himself speaks in tongues. And so I am not dismissing it as a gift. But this is not the central point of the chapter. It just happens to be one of the more debatable places. Um, and since it does discuss the topic multiple times, this, this chapter, I must give the scriptures the honor that they are due and at least acknowledge it. So prophecy, the next spiritual gift, is preaching, conveying God's truth in a way that people can understand them, and then it convicts them when they hear it. Knowledge, the third one, is the understanding, understanding the Bible in a deep and penetrating way, one that doesn't make sense, how they can understand it. Faith is living your life knowing that God has everything under control and not, and not letting your circumstances, either big or small, make you question that, knowing that God is doing great things even through the hard times. Giving, the last one, is holding on to everything that God gives to you with an open hand, ready to let others have that gift, knowing you are blessed so you can be a blessing to others, even if that means giving your life for theirs. These are all good things, but as the text clearly says at the very beginning, love is greater. Love is more important. Love is the foundation of our relationship with God and the witness of the church itself. 
So now that we're at least on the same page, uh, we un- and we understand that love is the best way of all, let's see how it needs to come out in our lives. Let's read 1 Corinthians 13, 4 through 7. Love is patient. Love is kind. Love is not jealous or boastful or proud or rude. It does not demand its own way. It is not irritable, and it keeps no records of being wronged. It does not rejoice with injustice, but rejoices whenever the truth wins out. Love never gives up. Love never loses faith. It is always hopeful and endures through every circumstance. These verses show what love does and what it doesn't do. 15 different ways. And notice how I said that. Love is an action, not a feeling. Nowhere in this passage does it describe a feeling. I think of it this way. You feel happiness because of the love shown to you. You feel attracted to someone, either because they're just really good looking, which probably is more like lust, or because of that love action that they did. But you really don't feel love, and our English has really helped muddy our minds on this uh, topic and when it comes to answering our question, what is love? One writer said that love is an action or a behavior or an attitude. It's something we do. It goes back, uh, if we go back to the definition of agape that I gave at the beginning, love is God's actions towards us. We don't want God just to feel that way about us. We want him to show us that he loves us. And it goes the same way for us. And the hardest part of love is when you love someone, you give something up. Love is giving something away, putting you in a position to be vulnerable and hurt. In this list of what love is and love is not, many commentators recognize that each one is directly applicable to a problem within the Corinthian church. Each clause is an antidote to their problems. And each of these problems will divide and cause factions within the church, diminishing its witness, while, on the other hand, love will enhance and build it up. Examples. In chapter 8, verse 1, Paul mentions how knowledge puffs up, but love builds up. In 3.3, 3, 3, it says that they are jealous. In 4.6, it says that they are self-promoting and puffed up. In 5.2 and 11.4, it says that they are shameful. In chapters 8 through 10, it says that they are seeking his or her own advantage. In 1 through 3, it talks about how uh, tongues will divide. In chapter 6, it talks about them being easily provoked and keeping lists of wrongs. None of these examples are easy. And if I went around the room and asked each one of us if we were loving in general, a loving person, every single one of us would say yes. But what about when we go out to eat and our meal is not quite right and you know that the waitress was not paying attention? What about when we um, are driving and someone pulls out in front of us and it's always right when you're in a hurry and they go really slow? Or what about when a good friend asks out a girl that you've had your eye on for a year and a half and she says yes and they become a long-term item? Or for me, it's when I'm going to the airport on I-44. We get to, uh, I, the, close to the I-270 turnoff and so you get in the right lane and you drive about five miles an hour for about 45, 50 minutes or an hour and some numb nut comes on the left-hand side of you, and, you're, and they're driving 75, and they just pull right in front of you and go right on. I mean, it makes me so angry. And if you, ask my, if you want to ask my boys, the things that I'm thinking and probably the things that I'm saying are not very loving. And so I don't know about you, but when I'm driving, that's one of the times when I really have the least amount of love shown in my life. But we don't, I don't have time to look at each one of these lists in the list that he gives us here, but I do want to look at a few examples. The Greek language has several words for patience. One signifies patience with circumstances, while another one is used only in reference to patience with people. The Lord, here, the Lord knows we both need both of these kinds of patience, but it's that second word that is on this list. It is the witness of the church that we love. We love other people and we need to have patience with them. And we all have people in our lives who need that little bit of extra patience. Boastful and proud are right next to each other, and most of the time in English, we would say that they are synonyms. Synonyms. Um, boastful in this passage is what you would think. It's kind of just asking for praise. It's, it's wanting people to like you. Proud, on the other hand, is a little bit different. Um, it's, it's, it gives the picture of someone grasping for power. It uses others to get what they want. It's just kind of like seeing people as stepping stones to get their their way. 
The third example, love never gives up. Other translation says love bears all things. This word is related to the word for a roof, um, offering a protection for other people from very bad circumstances. 1 Peter 4.8 says that love covers over a multitude of sin. This is the perfect example of what love is. It bears with others. It's, it protects them. When I read this list, I can think of somewhere that I am missing the mark on each and every single one. I would, f- I would fail this test if this were the test to get into heaven. I'd fail with a zero percent. I said at the beginning of the sermon that this passage has been a hard one for me. The third reason for that is this is true is because I have read this passage over and over and over the last few weeks, and each time I realize how poorly I do when it comes to meeting this goal of agape love. It has been a good but a very hard reminder of how I am to love, even if it is hard for me to do. Love hurts. I read about uh, not snipping at somebody, and then I go home, and within five minutes, my boys say something, and I snip at them. And it just it, instantly, it reminds me, I'm not, I'm not there yet. I, I, need, I need to learn what love truly is. Love is hard. Love is giving something up. Let me tell you the story that I read that touched my heart. One day I took Helen, this is another dad talking, one day I took Helen, eight years old, and Brandon, five years old, to the mall to do a little shopping. As we drove up, we spotted a Peterbilt 18-wheeler parked with a big sign on it that said, Petting Zoo. The kids jumped up and down and rushed and asked, Daddy, Daddy, can we go? Please, please, can we go? Sure, I said, flipping each of them a quarter before I walked into Sears. They bolted away, and I felt free to take my time looking for my saw. A petting zoo consists of a portable fence erected in the mall with about six inches of sawdust and a hundred little furry baby animals of all kinds. Kids pay their money and stay in the enclosure encapsulated with the squirmy creatures so their mom and dads can shop at their leisure. A few minutes later, I turned around, and I saw Helen walking behind me. I was shocked to see that she preferred a hardware department store to the petting zoo. Recognized immediately my error, I bent down and asked her what was wrong. She looked at me with those giant brown eyes and said, Well, Daddy, it costs 50 cents. So I gave Brandon my quarter. Then she said the most beautiful thing I ever heard. She repeated the family motto. The family motto is, Love is action. She had given Brandon her quarter, And no one loves cuddly, furry creatures more than Helen. She had heard my wife and I say her whole life, love is action. She had watched both me and my wife do something and then say, love is action. And now she had incorporated it into her own little lifestyle. It had become a part of her. What do you think I did? Well, maybe not quite what you think. As soon as I finished my errands, I took Helen, Helen to the petting zoo. We stood at the fence and watched Brandon go crazy, petting and feeding the animals. I had 50 cents burning a hole in my pocket, but I never offered it to Helen, and she never asked for it, because she knew the whole family motto. It's not love is action, it's love is sacrificial action. Love always pays a price. Love always costs something. Love is expensive. When you love, the benefits accrue to somebody else's account. My love is not for me, it is for you. Love gives, it does not grab. Helen gave her quarter to Brandon, and I wanted to follow through with her lesson. She knew in order to truly love, she had to taste that sacrifice. She wanted to experience that total family motto. Love is sacrificial action. This quick illustration is a touching example of what real love is. It also helps us to realize that when we love others, we are giving something up. It might be time. It might be fun. It might be money. It might be our lives. But in order to love, just as Christ wants us to, we have to love like he did, which was an action, not a feeling. Let's go ahead and look at the last section of 1 Corinthians 13, verses 8 through 13. Prophecy and speaking in unknown languages and special knowledge will become useless, but love will last forever. Now our knowledge is partial and incomplete. Even the gift of prophecy reveals only part of the whole picture. 
But when the time of perfection comes, these partial things will become useless. When I was a child, I spoke and thought and reasoned as a child. But when I grew up, I put away childish things. Now we see things imperfectly, but puz like puzzling reflections in a mirror. But when we, th then we will see everything with perfect clarity. And all that I know now is partial and incomplete. But then I will know everything completely, just as God knows me completely. Three things will last forever. Faith, hope, and love. And the greatest of these is love. So in these last few verses, it talks about seeing things not quite so clearly and not having full knowledge. The concept that is used over and over in all of the verses really is that of maturity and immaturity. While studying this passage, it kind of hit home to me with Valentine's Day, and then my wife's birthday is one week later. So I was trying to get my boys to give something to their mom that was meaningful, and it started to become a little bit difficult. Um, I don't know if you've read the book Five Love Languages, but I would recommend anybody who ever plans on getting married to read that book. It's a really good book. But my wife's two love languages are quality time and, and acts of service. My boys wanted to buy her this or buy her that, a stuffed animal or chocolates or flowers or whatever. And I said, no, that's not how your mom feels love. Your mom feels love through special time with her or doing something for her. And so we made her a coupon book. But when we talked about giving up television screens or Xbox for a whole day so we could spend time with mom, it got a little touchy when we talked about being trying to be quiet for a couple of hours so that she could enjoy reading a book or something. It's a little bit more difficult. When it's, it, some of these things that we had to give up made us give them. It, love was an action. They didn't think as mature because I am. I'm supposed to be their, I'm their dad. I'm a little bit more mature. Um, not really, but um, <laughs> anyway, but l love is learned. Love is practice, and I had to try and show them the way before they could get any better, before they could truly understand. Love is complete. Love is mature. What we are called to do is to perfect our love. Love is action. Love is not a spiritual gift. Spiritual gifts, as you learned last week from Shandy, are given and balanced out within the body of Christ. Some of us get knowledge. Other of us get tongues. But they are gifts. You can desire them, but some of us will never, ever have the gift of wisdom or giving. Some will never have the gift of tongues. They are gifts from God, and the recipient does not get to choose which one they get. God chooses. In his infinite wisdom, he chooses. But we are called to love, since this is an action and a lifestyle. As Christians, we are called to be great. No, not great. We're called to be perfect at love. Loving. When we, when we complete that task, we can start to focus our attention on the other areas of our faith, such as spiritual gifts. Until then, we need to make love our number one priority in our Christian walk, to champion that, and then we can truly see what God can do through us, his church. Our witness will be so great that God, through his church, will truly be on display. Just like the scriptures say in the last phrase of chapter 12 and in the first phrase of chapter 14, and now I will show you the most excellent way. And then 14, let love be your highest goal. My challenge for you is this week, strive for love. Perfect it. Practice it. Show it. Make it an action. Love is sacrificial action. Do it to people who don't deserve it. Do it to people who do. It's just our job to do love is sacrificial action. Let's pray. Father, I thank you for this passage of Scripture. I thank you for the perfect example of love that we get in Jesus Christ. That's why he is our Lord and Savior. That's why we need him in our lives to, to show us the perfect way. We want to be like you. It's our strong desire. Please grant our request and, and help us to grow in maturity in our faith. In Jesus' name, amen.